time. This lecture is going to wrap up our discussion on conservation and managing the environment. So you should have watched the film Milking the Rhino. If you haven't, make sure you watch that before you continue with this lecture as it follows the film. And so just to recap, there's these two basic views on how to value biodiversity uh, in the conservation literature. This includes the intrinsic value of biodiversity, sort of nature for nature's sake, and also the utilitarian value, um, conserve nature because we rely on it, we need it, uh, we want to be able to continue to use it. And so the national park concept is based off the intrinsic value of biodiversity. This idea that nature must be preserved free from human influence. And the result of that has been coercive conservation, uh, removing people from the environments that they've long inhabited in order to save the environments, um, supposedly. And the result has been from this national park paradigm, less powerful groups, especially indigenous and small scale societies have suffered. They have been kicked out of their lands because they were considered the problem. Um, Maasai cattle herders excluded from the Serengeti, the Kung of the Kalahari kicked out of the Kalahari game reserve. Uh, same story among the Native Americans in North America with the establishment of Yosemite and Yellowstone. All of a sudden, uh, traditional settlement became illegal squatting and traditional hunting and or resource use became poaching. The growth of protected areas has risen in the last several decades, as have the problems that have been associated with them. Uh, these, these specific problems we've been talking about in terms of protected areas. Um, First of all, they don't seem to be extremely effective in terms of conserving biodiversity. I mean, if that's the goal is conserving the biodiversity most essential to the healthy functioning of our planet and the survival of our species and all the other species on Earth, are we actually doing that when we establish parks that protect beautiful scenery, but maybe not actually sites of high biological diversity? Um, also, when we protect just islands or pockets of different areas instead of entire ecosystems or migration patterns, empirical evidence have shown that that's not very effective in terms of conservation. And on top of that, there's been a lot of what we call paper parks, meaning they exist, uh, protected areas or national parks on paper, they've been established, air quotes, they might receive funding or recognition. People might get credit for establishing them, but they're don't, they are not actually managed or regulated in any real way. And thus they do nothing for actual resource management or conservation. And on top of all these problems on the environmental side of conserving the environment, uh, this approach has just trampled the rights of local people. Since the 1980s, throughout the history of conservation, uh, the strict protectionism, fines and fences, national park paradigm has been replaced in many cases by something called community-based conservation, um, CBC is the acronym. And community-based conservation is conservation that recognizes the rights as well as the value in including the local community, the local resource users, whose very livelihoods depend on those environments. And so this reflects a shift to the utilitarian view of biodiversity. Um, not so much conserving it just so for nature's sake, right, which often results in sort of conserving other people's environments so that Westerners can still enjoy them. Um, but the shift to this utilitarian view or approach, conserve biodiversity so that people can continue to use it, continue to subsist off it, rely off of it, but sustainably. Um, let the people that are part of that environment still use it. And in doing so, pr that provides them an incentive to actually protect it, conserve it. If you disenfranchise them from that, um, the people living on these boundaries have no reason to really respect them. I mean, kind of put yourself in their shoes. And so the emerging consensus that the way the field is headed is that environmental protection, conservation has to be coupled 
with alleviating poverty, with building up capacity in local communities and instilling social justice, creating more equality, reducing poverty. Um, we will never achieve environmental justice unless we also achieve social justice. If you want people to protect the environment, they have to also be able to survive at a basic, decent standard of living. Um, if the difference for people is between hunting an animal or trying to plant a few more crops in the extremely already degraded soil or chopping down uh, that tree out there to maybe sell a little bit of firewood, to sell that in the market, to maybe buy a little bit of rice and feed you and your family for a day or two. If that animal, that tree, that soil is the difference between you and your life, um, your child's life um, or not, right? Your child living or dying, then what do you think people are gonna pick, right? Conservation, it, it's just, it, it'll never work if, unless it's coupled with social justice, um, right? Asking people to stay out of their environments in the name of conservation, even though we've already destroyed many of our own environments. Uh, social justice has to go with environmental justice. And so you see also in this approach, a shift towards human-centered conservation. Um, and remember, when we talk about humans, we're not talking about just Western commercial culture. We're talking about humans um, throughout space and time. So indigenous, small scale ones as well. <clears throat> and it also involves co-management and decentralized control. Um, Co-management meaning that decision making, participation, it involves all different stakeholders. Um, there might be conservation experts or scientists or other outsiders like non-government organizations involved, but the local community is also definitely involved. Um, it's sort of what we refer to as bottom-up uh, community-based. Well, community based and bottom up is sort of the same thing, but you build from the community up, from the bottom up, working with the capacities already there, um, working with the needs and wants of the locals to come up with solutions. <clears throat> this is in contrast to top down approaches um, that are managed typically just by outsiders coming in, imposing their own policy or strategy, usually based off assumptions um, that are often incorrect cross culturally and they sort of control the whole thing. Um, and the one thing about top-down types of projects like this, they're typically paternalistic, sort of this, we know what's best. Um, and the result again is often a lot of failed effort and resources in these development and conservation projects because they don't take the time to understand the local socio-cultural context and needs they're working in and the projects just fail. Um, so community-based conservation is one alternative that has worked out in certain cases. Um, it's not a monolithic solution or cure-all. And as we saw in the film, community-based conservation is not without challenges and problems. And so from the film Milking the Rhino that you watched, uh, I left you with these three questions to sort of think about. Um, and so just real quick, the first question, uh, what was the what's the meaning of the title Milking the Rhino? And there's different ways you can sort of look at this. Um, one way to read this. So many of the local groups, uh, indigenous groups in Africa, many of them used to be pastoralists, meaning they subsisted traditionally off of herd animals, cows, llamas, yak. It depends on the environment. Cattle primarily where we're talking about. And so they subsisted off herd animals and also supplemented that with hunting and gathering of uh, the wildlife. With colonialism and the neocolonialism that has followed in the global economy, indigenous people have been disenfranchised, basically kicked off of most of their land um, so that they can't really subsist as they, as they traditionally have. Um, and as more and more outsiders have come in, the land indigenous groups have traditionally used, excuse me, and grazed their cattle on is now coming into conflict with these same areas that conservationists are trying to protect, right? Um, and so instead of kicking people out, the same people that are then going to be living on the boundaries of that protected area that they've been disenfranchised from and told to respect in order to protect the environment. It's a lose-lose for the environment and the people. Um, and so the utilitarian approach is all about show people the value in 
not killing wild animals, in protecting the environment, in conserving the wildlife, um, even when sometimes these animals threaten their safety. Um, there's an example of the lions in the film. Elephants crop raid, they destroy entire villages. Again, we farmers in our country kill coyotes when they come kill their livestock or pets or endanger their young children. So show people the value in not hunting some of the animals, in not killing the wildlife, um, in not overgrazing, in, in letting the wildlife flourish. And you might lose some money on grazing land, you might not have as many cattle, there might be some damage from an elephant, but in conserving the wildlife, you are making money, you are milking the rhino through that money generated via the conservation uh, that can then translate into ecotourism or sustainable use. And so it's essentially putting a value on conserving those resources, conserving that environment for the value that it can continue to generate for the future. It's one way to look at the meaning of milking the rhino right? instead of traditionally milking the cattle, right? Pastoral groups. Um, so two other things to keep in mind is who actually benefits from the protected area? Um, if the goal of community-based conservation is to involve the local community and couple social justice with environmental conservation, is that actually being achieved? How are those benefits actually distributed? Um, so I'll leave you to sort of think about that from what you saw in the film. There's some examples where CBC is quite successful, others where it's absolutely not, and there's nothing community-based about it other than the word in the proposal that got funding for the project. Uh, one of the examples from the film, there's two sort of case studies in milking the rhino, um, one going on in Kenya and the other in Namibia, both in Africa. And in Namibia, sort of the second case study, there's this old woman in the village um, and they were she's sort of yelling at uh, the non-government guy or the liaison between the conservation org and the community. She's yelling at him um, about his crummy papers. And you can tell she's kind of savvy, too. One of the reasons she was upset was the distribution of these benefits. The community was only receiving something like 8% of the profits that the Eco Lodge was making for operating on their land. So the Eagle Lodge is making money. They're on their land, generating money from ecotourism. Uh, people are coming out to see these environments that the locals inhabit, including the locals at one point. They're even sort of exotified and part of the, the tour of wild Africa, if you will. And so is, is that a tangible benefit, 8% of the profits? Um, I mean, the Eco Lodge probably wouldn't really even exist without the community. Or I guess they could have just gotten rid of the community, right? That's what we used to do in the past. And I'm being facetious with that. Um, so is it fair? Is it actually community-based? Community How are the benefits sort of distributed? And then as you saw in the film, there's some other examples of it working a bit more successfully. Um, one in which it was not, one of my favorite examples, sort of towards the end, um, they're showing a, the possibility of a new eco lodge being built. Um, and I think if you remember the white lady sort of walking around in her high heels with her martinis and talking about how it's all for the community and teaching the locals how to set the silverware, all nine pieces of it properly, because people want to come out and see the local culture as it is, right? Um, or when they're taking people out to the village in the, in the film and you turn around and uh, people are erasing the footsteps in the sand. To, to make it look, the reason they do that is because people travel here to realize this myth of wild Africa. They don't want to see footprints in the sand. They came to see wild Africa. And so the people that live there continually modify the environment so that it looks like to outsiders wild Africa, right? Erasing the footsteps in the sand. If you turn the camera around, right, in all these cases of this footage of wild Africa, there's people there in every single case. Uh, people have been part of these environments for two million years. Um, so, and then this sort of last issue, if protected areas, um, PAs, are only, only possible through the utilization, the instrumental approach to biodiversity, Aren't they then at risk of being over harvested, um, used unsustainable in an unsustainable way since the resources can be used? Um, and that is potential. Um, it's sort of a pro and a con. It depends on the particular 
context and situation. Um, sometimes it works out well, sometimes it doesn't. Right? You saw in the film, again, um, the one example with the lions. Um, so the locals are allowed to kill them if they come close and endanger them. Um, again, we, we killed every single grizzly bear in California, pretty much, except for the one on the flag. So in the film, they're allowed to kill the lion, but also the scientist that works with the lions, the biologist, is trying to explain that there's there can be more value in not shooting the lion as people will come out to see the wildlife. So if anything, if you take anything away, realize these issues are quite complex and there are not simple solutions like building a fence between us and them to complex problems. <clears throat> so let's sort of actually explore this last thing um, about if, if they're open to use, uh, are they not at risk of being overexploited and thus defeating the whole goal of establishing a protected area? And so we need to be careful not to romanticize or assume that local or indigenous people are automatically intentional conservationists from Stevens and DeLacy, um, sort of the legacy of Yellowstone and also new directions in conservation. And they touch on this notion of indigenous people being sort of intentional conservationists. They reflect conservation attitudes and they go through examples of how different societies have various customs and beliefs surrounding things like taboos on hunting certain species, taboo meaning pro prohibition, you're not allowed to hunt this species, or also restraint in resource use, like certain areas, uh, maybe spawning areas in marine ecosystems or other areas in the forest are off limits, um, especially maybe during certain seasons, um, or ideologies in which reverence and respect for nature is sort of built into the worldview and the either religion or ideological views. And so th this, these examples, what I'm alluding to here, it reflects this concept of the ecologically noble savage. Um, so sort of back Europeans would call, you know, indigenous people primitive or savage and sort of same idea here, but also this romanticized notion of, you know, the noble savage. They took care of the environment. The Native Americans used every part of the buffalo. This type of myth making is what I'm talking about. And we sometimes romanticize, sometimes falsely, about indigenous groups and small scale societies as being automatically in tune with nature. Um, so is this necessarily true? Are indigenous people automatically intentional conservationists? Um, in the same way that Western conservationists go set up a protected area with the goal of conserving and protecting nature. And so we'll explore this just briefly through um, a study done by Alvar uh, in 1992, or that's when it was, the results were. And so the main question he sought to answer was, do Amazonian hunters maintain a balance with nature? Um, are they intentional conservationists or do they hunt in the most efficient manner possible? And so he looked at hunting among the Piro of Peru. You can see on the map a close up of the area in Peru that the Piro inhabit, it's sort of riverine oriented in the Amazon. So are, are they indigenous, are they intentional conservationists? Um, just a little bit about Alvard's study. He documented over 79 different hunts over a period of several years from 1988 to 89 and also went back and documented hunts from 1990 to 91. Uh, the end result was almost 700 hunting hours documented. And he documented uh, travel time, also how long did it take, um, encounters with prey, sort of where, what, who, how, were you in the jungle, was it by the river, what type of prey, um, the pursuit and also the kill. Um, also at this time, hunters were using shotguns. New technology had been introduced. So traditionally in this region, the Piro would have used prior to shotguns, uh, bow and arrow or blow guns. These sort of blow gun, you blow poison darts up through the tree um, to hunt spider monkeys and other different prey. And so again, the basic question he sought to answer was, do Piro hunters maintain a balance with nature? Are they intentional conservationists in the sense that they are methodical about what types of animals they kill to maintain this balance with nature? Um, or do they just hunt in the most efficient manner possible? Um, you know, 
the most economically efficient way in terms of, hey, the, the quicker and the faster I can kill it, um, the easier it is, the better. Or are they more intentional um, in regards to trying to conserve, maintain a balance? Um, and so something to think about is if you were trying to, as a you know, hunter, if you were trying to conserve the game populations and the natural abundance of the resources you typically hunt um, versus being just efficient as possible, um, quick and dirty, the more the better, the faster the better, what types of animals would you try to not kill if you were trying to be a conservationist? Um, you might avoid killing young animals that have yet to reproduce. You might avoid females um, or pregnant animals or animals in breeding or spawning areas. Um, you don't kill the species, the individuals that are most integral to maintaining a successful breeding population. And so another thing Alvard documented uh, for each species that was for each kill, um, he recorded the species, the sex, the age of the animal, the reproductive status, the weight, and also the type of technology used. Were they using traditional technology or shotguns? And so if you look at the, just one example from the data, uh, essentially what it shows is hunters were indiscriminate in choosing prey to hunt, um, meaning that they, they were not being intentional conservationists. They were hunting in the most efficient manner possible. So they weren't hunting sort of more males rather than females. Um, they hunt in some, some species more males, other species more females were killed, but in general they were indiscriminate. They weren't intentionally trying to minimize their impact on the population. Um, so you can sort of see the comparison here. And the statistical values, the chi-square and the p-value, don't I won't ask you about it, but what you're seeing is there's no significant difference between prey choice. Um, they weren't purposely trying to not kill females or purposely trying to hunt males rather than females. Um, if you have a p-value of less than 0 0.05, that means there's less than a 5% chance that more males are being hunted versus females or vice versa, there's less than 5% of a chance that that is due to random chance rather than intentional. So if we had a p-value of 0 0.05 or less, it would suggest hunters were, were, there was something going on causing them to kill more of one sex than the other, um, which would lead us to believe or infer, according to Alvrod, that they were being intentional conservationists. But we see no statistically significant difference. They hunt in the most efficient manner possible. They're not intentional, noble, ecological savages or conservationists, rather. So some basic conclusions of Alvard's work. Uh, hunters do not selectively choose sex and age types that would minimize impact on the prey. Hunters did not show restraint for harvesting species that were identified as vulnerable in the area to overhunting or vulnerable to local extinction. Also, when he looked at shotgun use compared to bow and arrows or blowguns, he found that the use of shotguns did not lead the hunters to kill or consume more meat than they would have had they been using more traditional technology. And hypothetically, theoretically, you, the more efficient technology shotguns, uh, you could kill more animals, right? You could be more efficient. Um, but it didn't have an effect. It didn't cause them to kill more and consume more meat, even though they technically could have, right, because of the technological advantage. And so the overall conclusion of Alvard's work is that rainforest hunters, the Piro, they do not practice intentional conservation. It doesn't mean that their practices and beliefs are not overall sustainable. It just means they don't set out in the same way as maybe Western conservationists to say, hey, let's set up you know, a national park in this area. So implications of Alvard's study. Indigenous people are not necessarily intentional conservationists, but they don't have a reason to exploit resources or prey or hunt beyond household needs. Um, you hunt and you gather resources based off what you and your family needs, the household, maybe the extended kin group, maybe the broader community or village. But beyond that, there's no reason to exploit things uh, past that. It, it would just go to waste. What would you do with it? And even with the new 
technology, the introduction of shotguns, which potentially could have allowed for more efficient hunting, uh, the Bureau did not increase hunting or meat consumption, even though they technically could have. Um, it didn't matter, blowguns, bow and arrows versus shotguns, it didn't make them eat more or hunt more. So it wasn't new technology that necessarily changes things. However, when you introduce markets, this changes things. When markets are introduced, there's now an incentive to consume, exploit, extract beyond household subsistence needs, beyond sort of community level subsistence needs. Because with markets, you can sell that surplus on the market for profit. And if you look at research, lots of uh, lots of examples show this has happened in indigenous communities, right? Once markets are introduced or brought in, uh, it can put a lot more pressure on the resource base because there's now this incentive to exploit beyond household use, community level use for sale in the market. Um, and this is not to demonize local people either. I mean, in, in Solomon Islands, for example, fishermen go or women, it's usually men, you go fish, um, maybe bring fish back, that feed the family, um, maybe bring a fish over to the neighbor um, who comes over later, get some rice. But you also maybe go sell a couple of fish in the Gizo market. Um, and then you save up a little bit of money and maybe in a year or so you can buy some corrugated iron for your roof. Um, and so when markets are introduced, there's now an incentive and a possibility to exploit beyond household use. And I've seen it. It's happened in Solomon Islands. And it's not even so much just locals that puts extra pressure on the reefs. That is sort of happening in Gizo. But you know what else is allowed in their ecosystems, their coral reefs? Um, factory trawlers, foreign factory trawlers that come in and destroy entire ecosystems to for fish commercially um, for profit on the global market. Um, and the factory trawlers that are coming in, that's definitely not used for local consumption. So if you want to know more about sustainability in our own culture, here is an answer for you. Um, this is, we're a commercial culture. And so this is sort of the answer uh, John Bobby would give you is for us, what resource use, the environment is tied up with markets and profits. And even if you don't care about this, even if your values are the opposite, right, as are mine in many cases, the people controlling the economy, the political system, the society, the structure of the world that we all live in. And I don't mean the president. I don't mean prime ministers. I mean corporate lobbyists. I mean corporations and powerful economic and commercial and political elites. These people, many of them do care about profit and they are the ones with the power to access most of our resources and the power to make most of the decisions that affect and structure the world we all live in. And the benefits and the costs of those decisions are often not distributed equally. And so what's the result of our culture, what Bodley calls the commercial world in terms of sustainability? And I'll leave you to sort of answer that for yourselves, given what we've discussed throughout the class. Um, you know, examples we looked at for our, in our culture, uh, you know, industrial food production. Um, we rely on high amounts of external inputs, fossil fuels, fertilizer, toxic pesticides, foreign oil. The focus, the drive is on economic growth. I mean, even as little kids, we teach our little kids about the rugged individual and sort of the measure of a person is, you know, their job or how much money they make. Um, whatever happened to values driven? Um, so, you know, these are some of the effects of our culture. And do you really, you think we can put a human on the moon 40 or 50 fucking years ago, but we haven't been able to figure out a more sustainable way to make our food or develop renewable energy sources? I don't buy it. Corporate and elite interests often block out or smother broader public environmental and social interests in these things, right? That's sort of our culture. Um, Changes in scale and culture towards the large scale, towards commercial culture, consumerism, and the values and ideologies that come with that. These are the threat to biodiversity, to the environment, um, not the presence of people. I mean, people have long coexisted with wild landscapes. Um, remember, environmental degradation, extreme social injustice, these are not natural human conditions. Anthropology shows us that. They're not natural results of the human species. 
Rather, these result from specific cultures, specific societies, specific social, economic, and political organizations, and the values and ideologies that dominate these societies. But um, the good news is that if culture is the problem, right, if people created it, people can also change it, right? We can also be the solution. We can be the change that we want to see. A few more things about conservation to wrap it up. So even though indigenous people are not necessarily intentional conservationists, it's increasingly being recognized that disenfranchising people from their territory can actually have adverse conservation effects, um, not to mention the concern for human rights and social justice. And so aside from sort of social justice concerns, it's actually also being recognized the support of the people living near the protected area, living on the borders of it. This is usually crucial uh, to it being successful as well. And so successful examples of community-based conservation exist. CBC hasn't been around um, as long, nearly as long as national parks and other types of protected areas. And so strict parks, um, the data shows, seem to be working, at least in some respect, in terms of vegetation recovery. The effectiveness in the long term of CBC is overall less known. Um, again, it hasn't been around as long. Um, so on the graph, the figure, um, a change in the area of natural vegetation since the establishment for 86 tropical parks. The majority of parks have either experienced no net clearing or have actually increased natural vegetative cover. Medium park age is 23 years. Um, and so you can see the black bars, basically that's um, parks that have regained or retained or recovered vegetation. The bars on the left, the white ones that have lost. So overall, um, the majority of them seem to have at least maintained the environment, if not um, potentially improved it. It depends on how you're measuring biodiversity, right? Um, maybe something else to keep in mind, and perhaps an also important question is, even if strict parks work, is this social injustice that it generates fair to sort of impose on other people? Um, again, especially given that we've already decimated most of our environments. And so communities are now the locus of conservation thinking. This is sort of the springboard, the focus. Communities can be seen as successful and sustainable alternatives to state and private management of resources. Um, with that said, communities as a concept has been somewhat essentialized. Um, and so what do I, what I mean by this, um, if I say to all of you in the class, you know, all of you are students, that highlights that you're all students, it highlights similarity. But in highlighting that one similarity, I've probably glossed over so many important differences among all of you in background, in perspective, in interests, in your identities, um, in so many other things. And so, you, communities cannot be homogenized. They're heterogeneous and they often contain differing and conflicting interests among the group. Um, and so in doing community-based conservation, the community has to be examined in terms of conflicting interests of the group. Um, you don't go to just one person in the community and assume that they are speaking for the whole community um, or that they, or even if they tell you they have. Right. Don't assume that you go talk to everybody. Um, when I'm in Solomon Islands, I don't go ask just the chief of the village what's going on. That person's going to have a very different perspective, probably, than the poorest person in the village. And this is true in Solomon Islands and the other main village I worked in, Pailange. Uh, I, I spoke with the chief and you know what he wanted? He wanted the church, this big ass cement church that somehow had been built in the village. I mean, keep in mind, they're all buildings are built out of like local materials for the most part. He wanted the church rebuilt. Um, and, you know, you kind of tell me, yeah, that's what everyone wants. Well, I went and talked to everyone else in the community and that is not what almost anyone else said. Right. Maybe a couple of his like close supporters mentioned that probably because they thought he wanted them to. Um, and not to demonize him, but just what he wanted, his needs, his view, very different from the poorest villagers in that community or even the majority of the rest of the villagers, right? They wanted houses being rebuilt. I mean, they were still not living in houses. They wanted 
iron for their roofs to keep the rain out. They wanted water tanks so that when water ran low, they didn't have to go without because their neighbor also had an empty tank. Um, fishing gear so that they could provide for themselves. Um, not, I was not getting, you know, we want the church rebuilt from most, most of them. So we have to be careful not to essentialize or homogenize communities. Um, Again, complex problems require complex solutions. And so CBC is not some monolithic fix-all. Um, and even when it does work, it's not without its issues. The debate rages on about which model of conservation is most effective. So on the one hand, we have the utilitarian or instrumental value of biodiversity. Uh, value it because, you know, whether you like this or not, we, we need it, we use it, and we rely on it. We want to be able to do that in the future as well. And then the intrinsic or inherent value. Um, nature for nature's sake, value it because it is, right? The tree has rights just like a person. And so depend, what model people think is most effective has a, it has a lot to do with how they view nature and the environment and human's place in it. And so this sort of summarizes the two views. Um, again, the utilitarian value, sort this results in the utilitarianism, a utilitarian approach to conservation. The intrinsic value results in protectionism and preservationism, the national parks paradigm. Under utilitarianism, uh, these folks tend to see nature or the environment as anthropogenic or cultural landscapes, right? These are human modified landscapes uh, and have been for a long time. That's true of many places on earth. Uh, whereas those that argue for preservationism uh, tend to see these environments uh, as wildernesses and natural landscapes, meaning they are untouched and separate from people and always have been. Um, people are the problem and you have to keep them out. Um, again, this is based on some major flawed assumptions that don't hold up cross-culturally. Uh, and so the one utilitarian results in consumptive use. Extraction is allowed in these protected areas, um, but usually with that's regulated what's, what is allowed. Um, whereas the intrinsic, the parks paradigm, uh, don't touch it. No consumptive use allowed. Um, protect it. Utilitarian you, uh, approach, sort of decentralized management, bottom up, involve the community. What are their needs and desires and work? Build off that. Right. Especially if you want it to work. Um, on the other hand, sort of top down centralized management, outsiders coming in paternalistically imposing um, things that they think will work, but they just might not. Right. Because they don't they're not a good fit for the local people, the cultural context. They don't take the time to understand what's actually going on. Uh, and so the solution isn't really a solution. Um, what model leads to the most desired outcome in terms of actual conservation? Again, um, there's there's debate about that, and it sort of depends on what you what your assumptions are about nature and humans' place in it. A final point to wrap us up: uh, anthropologists and really social science scientists in general tend to argue that conservation is more of a social and political process rather than a biological or ecological objective. Um, what do I mean by this? And, and so if you really get down to it, why do you want to preserve nature? Um, is it just for nature's sake? And I think a lot of us would maybe say, yeah, I mean, we are in a sustainability class, but is it really just for nature's sake? I mean, why do, why do you care about it? Why do you care about pandas and elephants and lions, um, but not maybe cockroaches or earthworms or slugs, or I know these aren't the best examples, or the Delta smelt, right? That slimy little fish endemic to the San Joaquin estuary um, that's going extinct due to irrigation withdrawal in the Central Valley, right? So why, why do you want to preserve nature? Um, is it for nature, just for nature and the animals and the plants? Is that why we save elephants, but not the Delta smelt? I mean, it's there's some truth that actually we care about nature and conservation for human sake too, right? Because we like it, we care about it, we want it around. Um, kind of stepping away from the altruism for a minute. And then again, is saving elephants really conservation? Why not the Delta smelt, which is probably much more integral to the overall functioning 
of the ecosystem. And so why the elephants and not the Delta smelt? That's what I mean when I say conservation is more of a social and political objective uh, or process rather than a biological objective. Right? Save the elephants, but don't worry about all the grizzlies we killed uh, where we are, where we want to make sure we're safe from dangerous animals. And that's what I mean when I say it's a social and political process rather than a biological objective. And so from this point of view as conservation, as a socio-political process, um, six key issues to keep in mind. And I'm not going to ask you to name these, um, right? The point really is that, again, conservation is a social and political process. Um, anthropologists would argue more so than a biological goal. Um, so from this perspective, uh, human dignity, right? Who, who actually benefits from the PA? Is it the environment, the people? Neither. Is it outside sport hunters that come in and pay a lot of money to shoot the trophy animal? Um, who, bene who actually benefits? Legitimacy. Is the process considered appropriate and, and just fair uh, by those that are being most affected, typically the, the local resource users? Community-based conservation sounds great, but sometimes it's just a greenwashed term. Um, is it actually community-based? Is the community actually involved? Is it actually participatory? Or is, is the only thing community-based about it the word, right? Um, governance, who decides, who actually participates? Is it actually community-based? Accountability. To what extent, uh, what, excuse the typo, are all parties holding up their end of the deal? Um, like, for example, if the Eco Lodge says, hey, we're going to give you, you know, half of the fees from the Conservation Lodge and they're only giving them, you know, 5% of that, um, are they really holding up their end of the deal? We sort of saw that in the film. Adaptation and learning. We do not live in a static world and our solutions shouldn't be static either. How can we systematically learn and adapt from what's happening in the projects? Um, within the policies and improve it. And also non-local forces. How are local processes? How is conservation in Kenya or Namibia driven by wider political and economic processes? Right? You want to understand conservation in places in Africa? You have to understand the broader processes um, in, in the West and the broader world uh, to understand what's actually driving that. Okay, so that wraps thing up, things up for conservation, and we've got just one more topic for the semester. Have a good one, guys.